All right, so let's get started today. We're going to be diving into Bitcoin and what the outlook might be from not only a macro standpoint, but also an adoption curve that could be on the forefront and the future of where Bitcoin may be going. So we'll dive into all that good stuff. I think you guys are going to like today's show. we got a special guest for you. It will be fun. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. Uh, before we get started, I do want to thank our sponsor. That, of course, is Ledger. Ledger does a great job. They have this cool promo right now, which is... 30 bucks if you actually buy a Ledger Nano, uh, up to 30 bucks, and it's going to come to you in Bitcoin. So you can't really go wrong. It's a fairly good investment, I think, if you're ever wanting to do self-custody. And I'm finding more and more people getting into self-custody. So all you have to do is go over to uh, ledger.com. Use our link down below if you want to. It does help the channel out. Uh, we appreciate all that good stuff. Joining me today is uh, a gentleman who has been on our show a couple of times. That's Mr. Corey Clifton, which is the CEO of Swan Bitcoin. Great to have you. Hey, Paul, thanks so much for having me back on. And, and by the way, congrats on the, the Ledger sponsorship. It's a, it's a good yeah. company. They're doing good stuff. They're, uh, they're killing it, I think. You know, I've, I've been a little bit uh, disappointed, though. I've wanted that Stacks. You know, I want that new digital version of that thing. You know, I'm just a tech geek, so I like all those new toys and uh, anything yeah. I can do. I'm also, you know, into those kind of yeah. things. Hey, hey, Corey, let's get into a few things here. First, it's been like five months since we've had you here on the show. Swan Bitcoin rolling out a lot of stuff. Just so everybody knows, this is not a sponsored thing. Corey didn't ask us to say anything. So we just want to know, what have you guys done that's new for Swan Bitcoin since we talked last? Boy, did we did we talk just before or just after the FTX collapse? Do you recall? It was right, right, uh, right after. It was right after the right FTX. After. Yeah. Okay. Wow. It, doesn't it feel like years ago? <laughs> that was a long time. But yeah. In crypto years. Yes. In crypto. Oh my years. gosh. Yeah. So uh, Bitcoin years, first, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess years. first we uh, expanded coverage for Swan Private. So this is our service for high net worth individuals and and corporate companies, entities. Uh, that's global now. So SwanPrivate.com. Yeah. Okay. You can sign up anywhere in the world. Um, so that's really cool. In the USA, we launched the Swan IRA. So this lets you uh, put Bitcoin into a retirement account. And I've done it now. I've, I've transferred uh, a traditional and a Roth IRA over to Swan. It was incredibly fast and simple and smooth. So that's uh, swan.com slash IRA. Really, really easy to do. And I uh, highly recommend taking a look at that. Yeah, I'm on your website kind of going through. So uh, the IRA is now new. You've got the uh, private sector there jumping into that. You yep. had mentioned that that with private, there was going to be like these uh, events for Bitcoiners and kind of the expansion yeah. of education. Have, have you guys started that? Oh, yeah, yeah. So we've been doing them in Los Angeles since last June. And actually, so event number 11 was last night in LA. And we had uh, Robert Breedlove, and uh, Alex Gladstein from Human Rights Foundation were the speakers, uh, had about 120 people there. It's mostly Swan private clients, but also some partners and also people that they bring. So yeah. we encourage people to bring a guest and, and you know, help get them orange pilled. Um, yeah, these things are turning into uh, quite the happenings. So it's the first Thursday of the month in Los Angeles. And then what you're talking about is, I think, in January. So we've done three of them. The fourth is coming up on the third Thursday of every month. It's in South Beach. So we're doing okay. two a month, one in LA, one in Miami. And we're also looking at uh, potentially adding Dallas here in a, in a few months. You know, we've had a lot of people that I think use Swan or are friendly with Swan in essence on our show. We've had Greg Foss on, uh, Dr. Yep. Jeff Ross comes on quite a bit. Uh, and they, you know, these are kind of our Bitcoin experts. And uh, it was ironic, you know, the last time we had Foss on, uh, he was calling for Credit Suisse to literally uh, any day now fall. And like it literally happened the Monday after he was on the show. The PR That's comes amazing. out for Credit Suisse and uh, and the debacle that is happening within the banking industry. So I definitely want to want to get into that. Uh, and, you know, if you don't if you guys have never uh, maybe some of you guys watching now had not seen Greg Foss's interviews, go back and check our videos uh, with Greg. He does a really good job breaking down the banking sector, and he's he's very astute in it because he was a longtime fund manager, major fund manager, much like you, Corey. He's been in the finance business for a long time. So, I yeah, Greg is you, Greg is a said. great thinker. I was actually on the way down to the event last night. I was just commenting to a, a friend of mine about Greg and thinking like. 
how much time do you have to spend in markets to even know what to pay attention to, to exactly. be able to deliver the value that dude does on a daily basis? <laughs> because I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the selective attention and the selective perception to, to choose the right things to read even, yeah. you know, like what yeah. a skill that is. I guess I take it for granted and kind of like startups and VC and maybe Bitcoin narrowly, I know what to pay attention to, to deliver value, but like so lost when it comes to markets and bonds and credit and all of this stuff that, that people like Greg and Jeff bring to the table. They're, they're real assets. Talk to me a little bit about third party custody. Uh, I want to get into some of this because some, you know, we talk to a lot of people. Uh, I do coaching around high net worth individuals, mainly introducing them to Bitcoin and other assets, digital assets out there for the first time. A lot of times we get into to self custody and or third party custody. And when you get into things like that, obviously Swan, that's kind of a pass through because I understand with your service, you can go right into self custody if you choose to do it or you can stay with Swan. The other options out there in the market, you've got, I know you guys use Prime Trust, uh, but when you look at these services out there in the marketplace, are these trustworthy, including Swan for that matter? If you're a big, if you're saying, hey, I want to buy Bitcoin, maybe I don't know how to buy it, I'm using the white glove service with Swan, but then I graduate up to I want to hold my own Bitcoin. What is your recommendations to people who come to you guys with those kind of agendas? Yeah, so we we try to move everybody on a path toward self custody, whether that's your own key setup or whether that's using a multi sig provider. So that's that's our goal with every single Swan customer, and the vast majority of Bitcoin that's ever been purchased through Swan is off platform, has been moved into self custody. That said, there are people that don't get comfortable with that, or they have a family situation where you know maybe one spouse isn't quite up to speed and not comfortable with with full self custody and self sovereignty. And so you get situations where they just want to use a custodian. And in that case, I think you just want to go with uh, segregation of brokerage or exchange and custody. So you want a mm -hmm. different legal entity, uh, ideally one that is a trust company where you actually own the Bitcoin in your own legally owned trust account. So that's the setup yep. that we have with the legal custody at prime trust in the name of each of our customers in their own trust account. And then the physical custody of the coins being done by somebody amazing that, you know, has a big rep and a huge team and, you know, knows how to handle the nuclear football. So, you know, that would be like, you know, like a Nidig or a Fidelity or a Fireblocks or something like that. Yeah. So Prime Trust uses Fireblocks for their physical custody, as does basically most of the crypto industry. You know, it was, I think they raised on an 8 billion valuation. They've got a thousand some employees. They're, you know, New York offices, all that. So um, that seems to be a pretty good setup. I think you really want that segregation. The last thing you want is like the place that you're trading and where you have where they're opaque. You don't want that opacity yeah. and that, you know, not knowing what's going on with your funds. I heard a horror story last night uh, from one of our clients whose friend had all of their coins in self custody for a long time. And literally two weeks before the FTX blow up had ah. basically like a family freak out and he was, you know, maybe had a health issue or something and was worried about not being able to transfer his coins to his wife. And so he transferred all his coins to FTX so that there would be an account manager and somebody yeah. to be able to <laughs> give the coins to his wife. So you have to really think about this. It's not, it's not just self custody or third party custodian, it's self custody. And then make sure you choose the right partner if you're going to go that route you know ideally use multi-sig so we bought specter yeah. last year and we'll be launching swan custody in five or six months goal is to get it out before the pacific bitcoin conference uh october 5th and 6th in santa monica california sure. um, all right yeah so we should like have our own multi-sig yeah. out by october but in the meantime you know casa Spectre, Sparrow, uh, Unchained. These are great multi-sig setups that you can look at where you can have a helping hand. You just hit on something though that I think is really important in terms of the, uh, the legal aspect of how self-custody can work, especially, or third-party custody can work when you look <coughs> at these kinds of, of differences. And to your point, yeah. for those of you, and a lot of people that watch our show, they might be coming into Bitcoin for the very first time they're just exploring the technology, how it works, and they're learning what sovereignty means. And uh, in many cases, they don't necessarily understand 
the differences between, hey, I have a bank account, I put my money in there, I can go get it when I want, it's safe kind of thing. We'll talk about that in a minute because that's a complete facade. Uh, the same thing kind of with certain exchanges is also occurring. But to your point, you hit on something very interesting there, and that is setting up an individual trust for each individual holder and then using that trust as an entity to hold the tokens in a third-party uh, self-custody. To me, that is like one of the ultimate, almost like security de safe deposit boxes in a way because now nobody can touch that because it's in an individual trust. Uh, it is truly locked in as your you know, sovereign asset. And that I like because you're right, to some people, holding this on a little stick in your bedroom gets a little bit unusual, especially when you get into you know, six figures and above on that. Is that one of the reasons that you find a lot of people coming to SWAN? I would not say that that is one of the reasons that people come into Swan. I think they come to Swan like for the education and the signal mm -hmm. and kind of the the community and you know and just a better product, a better, easier way to accumulate Bitcoin. So I think that's why people come to Swan for the most part. Um, I'd say with the continued rollout and sort of growth of Swan Private, we have gotten more people asking to transfer their coins to us for custody. Yeah. But we still, you know, everyone that comes in through Swan Private gets a managing director as their point of contact. This is going to be, you know, one of the top Bitcoin experts in the world who understands self-custody deeply. And they're talking to them about how to move on that path toward, toward self-custody or multi-sig. Um, multi-sig is, is a version of self-custody. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we're just always kind of trying to move people toward self-sovereignty as much as yeah. they're willing and able. I find that to be one of the most aha moments with, uh, you know, the weekend seminars and, and, you know, events that I do. Once they see that process, one, how simple it is, and two, how enlightening it is for them to be able to hold digital assets like Bitcoin on a, you know, on a self-custody device. Uh, it really changes their dynamic of even how they think about business. You know, I've got a lot of business owners that think, oh my God, this, this changes everything, you know, especially with the way and yeah. speed in which this all works. Talking about that, um, and we're going to get into banking here in a second, but I want to talk about stable coins and the ability to at some point when you're, you know, you're running a business, you're holding a lot of Bitcoin as an asset. And you need a little bit of cash flow, so maybe there's nothing out there to take loans against that Bitcoin, so you got to go sell some. You're going to sell this over to a, an asset, probably a, maybe a stable coin. If I were selling it to a stable coin, what would be the stable coin you would select? Um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, what, what is the user journey here? Why do they need the stable coin? So, they need dollars so to pay for something, right? Yeah, yeah. So I can't go okay. right to a dollar. Um, at least most cases, I'd have to move my Bitcoin into an exchange, most likely. Oh, I see. Uh, or I've got a, I can go into a stable coin that I can hold right there and then use that as sending it out, rather because I can't send out the dollar. But I need that. But I've got a, a vendor, because we do this all the time. We have vendors that will take USDC But you still have tether. to exchange the Bitcoin for... Tether or USDC, right? So you're still yeah, using but it's usually an exchange on an exchange to get that done, or you know whether we go into a swap. Yeah. But the point is, you're getting in and out quickly, so you're not exposed yeah. hopefully very long. But if I'm holding one, I've got yeah. to hold one over here for a little bit so I can go pay some people. What would you use? Gotcha. Oh yeah, I mean I think I mean you're not. I think that Tether and USDC are both fully backed. So and I don't think that either of them wants to like kill the, kill their golden goose i mean they're they're both clipping four and a half percent on treasuries right now yeah right and not sharing not? that interest well actually i guess i guess circle is basically giving away pretty much all of their profit to coinbase and other partners to try to convince yeah. people to hold usdc but tether seems to be printing money if you look at their q4 oh, results huge. i think they made 750 million dollars profit in q4 so um yeah, I don't think they're going anywhere. Uh, I don't think you're going to see them rug pull <laughs> anybody. Okay. And, and th those are that's basically like the best business model on the planet right now. Right <laughs> is, now, for sure. Is having it's, a stable coin. Um, yeah. the, the only one I would stay away from, obviously, is uh, is BUSD. I, I don't trust. Uh, I don't trust Binance at all. 
Well, we're going to get a chance to talk about Binance because there's there's a lot happening with uh, CZ, Binance, obviously with the CFTC and other things going on. Before we get into that, I want to jump into banks. Banks happening, obviously the this debacle with Silicon Valley, uh, what we saw was Signature kind of getting almost rug pulled by the, by the feds, which uh, now many people are looking at that as a very unusual situation. Um, I won't get into the narrative of that. If you guys want to look at all of our breakdowns on the banks, we have a bunch of bank videos out there breaking each one of these down. But when you look at this, this has to be a huge windfall for Swan and anybody else really operating in the Bitcoin space because I know many of my own friends, neighbors, business partners were looking at Bitcoin as a portion of their hedge against cash. What do you see this playing out in terms of adoption over this next, you know, one to two years as a significant indicator? Yeah, so this banking crisis that we just saw last month, which may or may not be over, it's still kind of roiling and we'll see if there's another shoe to drop. What I think it's created is a much longer expected duration of the period for which the audience will be very willing to listen to someone talking and explaining about Bitcoin. So it's basically the longest extended period that we've ever had in the history of Bitcoin, where the audience is receptive to talking about Bitcoin, learning about Bitcoin and, and, uh, and thinking about potentially adding it into their own wealth strategy and their wealth preservation strategy. So in previous bull markets, there's usually a lot of news about Bitcoin for four to six months, kind of the blow off top and then the crash. And that happened in 2013, 2017, mm -hmm. 2021. And, you know, if we are still on this four year cycle meme with three up years and one down year, last year was the down year. This is an up year. If there's two more up years, usually you would only see a lot of interest on Bitcoin as it blows through the new all time high. So as exactly. you crash through, you know, 69, got into 70, maybe go into six figures, something like that. Again, total, like we'll see if the meme continues, but you know, I have to operate as if it will until it stops working like that. Cause it's, <laughs> that's the probabilities are, we've got three data points that it works like that. So we'll see if it does a fourth. Um, anyway, the banking crisis being so recent in everyone's memory and everyone having this shared experience of watching this happen and seeing the reaction of the system to it and then having you know, VCs and bankers, you know, talking about, well, maybe you want to hold something outside the system. We're like, yes, mm -hmm. told you so. We've been telling you for 12 years, <laughs> you want to hold something outside the system. Thank you. Um, we have tons of new companies. I would bet we've had between two and 300 companies come in in the last month uh, looking to add Bitcoin to their treasury, uh, specifically for this reason. And it's yeah. not it's not as a as an inflation hedge, which was, you know, another one of those BS narratives that we find in the space sometimes that I tried to fight against uh, for the you know, 2021, 2022 duration. Um, but it is a hedge against having all of your money inside of a system that is based on credit and where they don't allow narrow banking. Yeah. Everything has to be fractional reserve by decree. You know, it, it's a dollar's worth of Bitcoin held outside the system. I mean it's worth at least 50% more than a dollar inside the system, if not two to three times more, if you think about it in, in those terms. So I think that's the main thing that people are taking away. And I'm glad that people have been, be been beating that drum. And it's, you know, as, as Balaji, my, my uh, erstwhile uh, nemesis for all of his altcoin pumping over the years uh, said, we're all Bitcoin maximalists now. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, he's made some pretty um, gargantuan claims of Bitcoin to a million in, I think, 90 days with his bet. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. It was out. a good stunt. Yeah, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't was. a real bet. It was a nice yeah. stunt, though. Um, <laughs> I like it. I mean, th these are great. I Sometimes I feel uh, I don't necessarily like stunts like that because I think this is dealing with people's money and their savings yeah. and maybe their hard-earned dollars. So any anytime I see a, an influencer start to take... Uh, and for whatever reason, it doesn't matter because a lot of times we're in a bubble and we get too narrow in our bubble, not realizing that we're affecting so many people that are normal, everyday, hardworking individuals out there. So I'm always cautious yeah. of that. So uh, not a good thing. Anyway, back to the point of yeah. banks. This is I, another to stuff. hammer that home. And I know you know this, you know, about me from 
uh, us interacting and me being on Twitter and everything, like Bitcoin is a long-term savings technology. You For should sure. never buy Bitcoin that you have to sell. We don't even have a sell button at Swan. You have to actually <laughs> like get in touch with us through support if you want to sell Bitcoin. Like the yeah. whole point is is moving more of your wealth into a better savings technology over time and ideally saving you know the vast majority of it for the next generation um, sure. but at least have something like a, you know at least a six to ten year time horizon for every single little bit of bitcoin that you buy you should not be thinking about selling that for at least six to ten years i think a lot of people that are looking at bitcoin now at least on the uh, you know the surveys we run with our own audience in our diamond circle the people that we talk to in our in our personal coaching they they are looking that way they think in those formats they're also looking at this kind of this conundrum right now that we're dealing with because of the way that the the current ec economy and and financial system is set up because you have a lot of dollars going out of these regional banks moving into brokerage accounts which are flipping into money markets taking a t bill and getting four and a half five percent pretty much just by automation that's the argument, because the argument we just had this last weekend that I was uh, doing one. I'm not doing one this weekend, obviously, it was Sunday. But last weekend, we got into some pretty heated debates about, well, why would I go with Bitcoin when I can just flip my dollar into a T-bill through a, a treasury or through a money market account with Schwab or you know Fidelity or whatever, and, versus flipping over here into, into Bitcoin and not necessarily getting that 5% and I'm like, well, let's look at long-term sovereign wealth. Now let's step back and, and view it from that angle. What is the argument that you would give for someone like that who are trying to figure out how I move from these really high-risk dollar positions and into something that I can either make money on or long-term positioning with Bitcoin? Yeah. Well, I think it's a nice additional narrative that's always been there about the the self-sovereignty and being outside of the yep. system but obviously i still think the dominant narrative for bitcoin is that anyone who studies the global financial system and global economics and the u.s system and the dollar and studies bitcoin comes away with an expectation that the purchasing power of bitcoin will rise dramatically over time i mean there's only 21 million bitcoins and there's a lot of dollars and Bitcoin is the best tool in the shed for store of value of all assets that we have on this planet. And, you know, it's half a trillion dollars today. And the global store of value pie is, you know, depending on how you measure it, somewhere between 400 and 900 trillion. So if your expectation is that the best tool for the job will capture more share of market of the global mm -hmm. store of value pie over time, then there's a lot of upside for Bitcoin. So, you know, I think of any Bitcoin that I own, you know, I, I don't set any near term price targets, but it's, you know, it's kind of my base case that we have, you know, way more than a 50% chance, probably like a 75 to 90% chance of sat cent parity or million dollar Bitcoin by 2030. So I think, I think yeah. we do have like a 30 X in this asset over the next seven years. Hey, Corey, when you look at the, this growth, and obviously we've seen the, the scam artists out there, you know, like Celsius and many others that were out there doing lending and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, there's an opportunity here because I think people will, as moving into this asset, much like most, most wealthy, wealthy individuals, they learn how to take loans against their assets, whether it's real estate, stocks, securities, wherever it might be. At some point, Bitcoin's going to have to fall into that, that area. Do you think there is any potential mainstream, whether you look at Fidelity with their recent launch or others that would be at that credibility level that might start doing loans on crypto on, on fairly uh, decent levels to where, when I say crypto, meaning Bitcoin primarily? Yeah. Yeah. What? You saw my shirt? Hold on. I have to show it for the audience. <laughs> uh, say crypto one more time. There you go. Anyway, I wore that for you, Paul. I know you, you mean Bitcoin, it. and he's don't get me channeling. Don't get me channeling. Uh, if I start channeling Paul Fitchin, it's going to get bad. <laughs> all right, all right, one of my great. favorite and we'll, best. We'll, we'll do that on. Time. We'll do that on the <laughs> VIP overtime, guys. Sign up for the the extra there service. Um, so, uh, boy, Paul, where were we? 
Oh yeah, we're so talking about asset backed loans. loans. So yeah, I mean yeah, it's it's a natural, loans. right? So so this is already being done. Um, so Unchained Capital has been in market with uh, asset backed loans for years, doing a, a, yeah. a great job. Um, they don't rehypothecate, so they basically just your Bitcoin sits there. You can even see it on chain and then it frees up cash. They'll do like 40 or 50% loan to value. Obviously you get margin called if the price plummets, then you have to pay back yeah. some of the loan or post some more collateral or something like that. So that's been out there for years. There are actually bespoke groups that do this, you know, like one-off deals for big asset piles and family offices. So there's probably, you know, three dozen groups that do asset backed loans. Anchorage does it. They're obviously much more of a crypto custodian, but they've been doing this. They do rehypothecate. Ledin does it. They actually have really good risk management and they sailed through this whole crypto crisis, mm -hmm. you know, unlike putting all their eggs in one basket, like Voyager did with Genesis or Gemini did with Genesis or anybody else did with these other guys that collapsed, you know, they had a diversified loan book. I think they were lending their customers funds to like 14 different counterparties that they had all vetted and you know the basically genesis was one of the 14 but they exited most of their genesis position early because they have real risk management the problem with some of these firms and that's why you have to actually do some diligence before you decide if you are going to go with a asset-backed lender and unlock some you know some dollars for spending paying for education or a car or whatever without selling your bitcoin you need to do some diligence on who that lender is if you want to go with a non rehypothecating, meaning they're going to let your funds, your Bitcoin just sit there and not going to lend it out the back end, on average, you're going to pay a slightly higher interest rate, but yeah. you don't have the counterparty risk of their loan book. If you want to go with the lower rates, and remember, there's people out there that just want your funds because, like FTX, they were actually just gambling your money, Celsius sure. was just gambling your money. Right. Like most of these people are just kind of gambling your money. Nexo is still out there, not in the US anymore. They got kicked out, but they're offering like, you know, 12% yields on on <laughs> dog poo coins, <laughs> you know, and it's because they just want the assets because they're operating as a hedge fund and they're going and trying to make money doing crypto trading stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So you just got to be really careful with who your counterparty is. I would stick you know, if you have access to U.S. entities that are, you know, regulated in the USA and have, you know, boards and investors and, and reputations, I would try to stick to those firms if you can. Um, and yeah, you just got to just make sure they either have really good risk management and a good reputation if they are rehypothecating or just eat a little bit of a higher interest rate and, yeah. you know, sleep well that they're not, you know, sending your coins to Three Arrows Capital. I think a lot of people would do that uh, not only for you know for Bitcoin, but they would do it for the U.S. dollar if you went in. And I know with you know Caitlin Long, her her bank custodia was denied by the Fed, but essentially that was kind of the model. There was a true one to one you know relationship with the the reserve asset. Whether or not, and I guess that gets my my next question. A couple of questions here. One is. Are banks or someone like an FTX, well, FTX obviously a bad player, but there's others out there that would probably fall into that category, or a bank, which one's worse now? Because I'm now it feels like both are equally bad. Maybe banks are worse bad because they are truly the trust, you know, the trusted people and have been for decades versus, you know, some 30-year-old MIT grad that thinks I might be able to start something in crypto. Do you think well, now I mean, it's kind of a way out or do you feel like no, no FTX still I mean, obviously, a bad guy or banks are bad guys? Of course. Of course, FTX was an absolute criminal fraud and so was Celsius. And, How you many know, frankly, bad I, guys are in not, banking though, Corey? I mean, geez, you could just list them Yeah, forever. but at the end of the day, like all the depositors. It's almost like if I go into FTX, all the depositors I feel like SVB, I'm a little bit aware that I'm at risk. Right? Don't you think? I'm, I I think Come a lot on. of people, These were people are not into stupid. It. They're not stupid. They're not stupid. Uh, They're not walking into a crypto. into it. Come on. A lot of people no were suckered into it. You think I of Celsius using the language of savings, right? You think of Celsius using the language of savings, talking about a you know, mark. better banking, trying to talk about deposits, talking about yeah. interest rates. Like they're using the language of personal banking services with regular yeah. banks, but they're providing high interest. And yeah. instead they were just defrauding and it was a giant Ponzi scheme. Like it's yeah, disgusting. Just risk. Yeah, risk, yeah, risk. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, but that's my fraud, point is when you not get just in, risk fraud. Yeah, you get into these areas that well, yes, so the banks were, can't do the fraud true. part. They can't do the criminality part. They can't do the lying about their assets part. They're heavily yeah, regulated. they just take it. They they just take it. <laughs> they don't but lie about it. They, they just have, take it. But they have the put of you know. I mean, what happened? They they stepped in and made all the depositors whole, right? Every that's SVB a that's a rare. Gonna that's going to be a rare back. case. They cannot repeat that. Corey, you know that. That's just not fundamentally or economically possible. They're, they've been doing it for 50, 60 years, and eventually and printing, it printing may crack. Fiat to, it's going to crack. There's but no doubt that that's going to crack. Obviously, we agree. This is, uh, this is <laughs> a 52-year experiment that's already yes. very long in the tooth, and no yep. purely fiat system has ever made it this far. Mm -hmm. um, they've all collapsed, and frankly, into hyperinflation way faster than this one has. Uh, but the idea that we wouldn't have fractional reserve banking in the future is kind of silly too, because we will, even if we're completely on a Bitcoin standard by like 2060 and there's no dollar, I would agree. you will still I don't have think... fractional reserve banks banking on I don't Bitcoin think... yeah, I, because I, people, I people are going to want yield. Some people are going to be, ex mm -hmm. they're going to accept some level of risk. They're going to park their Bitcoin with a bank, a bank that they trust to make smart investment decisions, that bank is going to lend out the Bitcoin to businesses based on their underwriting standards. And the economy is going to function very much as it always has with capital allocation happening and some people wanting to have income on their assets. Yeah. And it's just how, how it's going to be. And, but you'll have the option not to do that if you want to. And you yeah. can just sit there and hold your Bitcoin and, and basically trust in the appreciation, the capital appreciation of of the asset right yeah. um but we'll still have banking yeah and i think it's it's the question mark of there's no way to unwind this system it, it's really just a matter of what that value is going to be sure there might be another reserve asset that starts to rise to power that we get multiple reserves i mean if you look back at the sterling pound it had a period in time in which we saw dual assets handling reserve for the world uh, it's mm -hmm. very possible that could happen again. And of course, this will be interesting because I think Bitcoin will be one of those assets that are probably in the mix as to how that might play. Gold might play back into the market. We see a lot of people, including sovereign nations, collecting it. So there's a lot happening there. Yep. All right. So, Corey, I want to run a gambit at you uh, and, and I want to get your interpretation of what these kinds of things mean. Maybe they mean nothing. Maybe there is something here. First thing I want to jump to is Riot. Riot goes into a corporate rebrand. They're now called Riot Platforms. So away from blockchain into platforms. Maybe there's something there, narrative, uh, perception, public perception, you know, those kind of things. Then you jump over here to ordinals. Ordinals have been flying up the charts. If you just look at some of the growth that we've seen here, obviously that's involving what's happening over at Stacks. I know you're not a lover of Stacks. But I want to get your opinion on ordinals. But it does create a very intriguing element for what might be happening within Bitcoin itself in terms of other utility. So narrative, utility, does any of this mean anything for Bitcoin or is this just noise? I mean, it's basically just noise. Like it doesn't, doesn't really matter much. I think the signal is probably what's been happening in Lightning, and in particular, more recently, the interaction of Lightning with Noster, which is a mm -hmm. decentralized social network yeah. platform. So basically, functions like you know, like BitTorrent or something like that. So I think these decentralized applications like Noster and Keat, which is peer-to-peer -peer video chat, are giving the lie to the entire altcoin industry because they're proving mm -hmm. that massive scaled decentralized applications with millions of users can function the way that decentralized apps have always worked in the past, which is the price of using the application is running a node on the network. Yeah. Um, so it's basically contributing your bandwidth and your compute to be able to operate this decentralized network. So this is much more the flavor of Bitcoin. And this is really making it easier than ever to answer the questions of people new to Bitcoin and crypto wondering about, you know, well, what is this Web3? How could they possibly all be working on this stuff if there was nothing there? And it's like, well, there have been plenty of industries that have sprung up where there was no there there, even mm -hmm. if they spent a decade and tens of billions of dollars trying to get something done. Like there is no solar manufacturing industry in the USA, right? And there is not going to be 
this big web three industry, blockchain, crypto, DeFi, NFT, whatever, creating new micro currencies that can't compete against Bitcoin and the dollar over the long term. We don't need all these little micro currencies. Um, as far as, um, yeah, I mean, Riot just wanted to get rid of the blockchain thing because it's a Bitcoin only firm and it's run by Bitcoiners and, you know, they're just 100 percent focused on Bitcoin. So I think that was the, the reason for the rebrand there. Um, and then as far as ordinals, like that has nothing to do with Stacks. Stacks just did what they always do and kind of jumped on the marketing hype train and tried to insert themselves into a conversation, take advantage of something that other people were already doing. Well, it's been uh, it's been around before, and you know it's even within the Satoshi's uh, white paper uh, as to what these kinds of tool sets could be. So there's been there's been narratives kind of going in that direction for a very long period of time. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that Stacks didn't do it, right? Because other other people created ordinals. No, only capital. Um, they're capitalizing did. on the current scenario, which is what's, exactly. what we're seeing right now with with the ordinal scenario. But okay, so yeah. that, that's good. Again, that you're it's... saying Lightning is is kind of the winner here, at least in the function of really where use case can be used. Forget about these other things. Focus on all these light not forget about i mean projects. if you're having fun with it that's fine like it it's an open protocol and you can do with it whatever you want it's just mm -hmm. that you know putting monkey jpegs on bitcoin pales in comparison to state free money and sure. being able to have peer to peer cash instantly and nearly for free between any two people on the globe like obviously these are much bigger problems that are being solved than like digital collectibles. So yeah. it's just uh, you know a drop in the bucket versus the ocean of value that's being brought by Bitcoin as, as money. Um, so I think that's why I'm just kind of like, who cares? Like have fun playing with your JPEGs, doesn't matter. What are your thoughts about when you, you look at the evolution of where money may be going? And, and you, you mentioned Robert Breedlove's name. Uh, we're gonna have him on the network next month. Uh, Robert does a good job of explaining, you know, kind of this value proposition of what money is. He does a great job with that. But if you look at something like, um, let's just take Elon for a second, what he's doing with Twitter, the likelihood of him reining in this idea of X.com becoming some sort of monetary system. I still think he has a little bit of a burr in his saddle from his time at PayPal, which is really where he bought the X.com URL from. He got that because that started at, at, in his PayPal days. He bought that back from them and his intent is going forward. Obviously, we know his PR stunt with Doge this week. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think he or, and or Jack Dorsey, which obviously is leading us into Noster and kind of where that future might go, who wins that battle of decentralized money and or decentralized value working into the social spheres? <laughs> The winner of the monetary protocol will be Bitcoin and it will be whoever aligns themselves with promoting Bitcoin because it's decentralized. It's the shelling point of money. Like mm -hmm. we're not all people who don't like Elon's currency are not going to be cool with Elon's currency being the global currency, just like yeah. Chinese don't want to use the dollar and sure. people in the US don't want to use the yuan, but both can game theoretically come to the equilibrium yeah. of using Bitcoin, right? So that's why Bitcoin is going to win is because the game theory is everyone can accept using Bitcoin versus their opponent's money. Yeah, decentralized so. obviously is the is the game uh, behind that. We exactly. we believe in that in a big way. You know, we've been looking at this idea of decentralized media for quite some time, and I keep we can p continue to decentralize what we're doing more and more. And everybody's asking me, well, Paul, why aren't you centralizing in like a website? And I'm like, listen, you have to be able to work into these zones of where not only the communities are being built, but where the best technology is being built and how that integrates into the fabric of how people will use this stuff in the future. Education, content, entertainment, you name it, it's all gonna eventually kind of go that way, just like money. I truly believe will eventually make its way there. Now there's gonna be a lot of nations that fight this tooth and nail. You know, you've got the US government right now selling 215 million in C Silk Road money uh, Bitcoin, and they're going to maybe dump another 1.1 billion into the market. Really, Bitcoin hasn't had much of a move with this kind of pressure in terms of sell pressure. With these kinds of things happening, 
but also at the narrative of what's happening from the banking debacle, people questioning the value of the U.S. dollar. You, you know, you've got China and Russia colluding now to try to create another monetary system. What do you think and why and do you think uh, Bitcoin accelerates? You mentioned this 24 month potential adoption window right there. Do you think everything pours in uh, to what's happening here on a global aspect? I mean, I, I, it does certainly feel like we're in the early stages of another eventually ripping bull market for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Whether it happens or not, it's still a bull market for Bitcoin adoption. And that's why I loved yeah. the, you know, when I, when I joined this, this little virtual studio with you, I think your producer had said uh, adoption bull run or something, yeah. which I think is like a very clever and interesting modifier. And it's the one I've been talking yeah. about for the last few weeks. Uh, again, I just think we're going to, regardless of price, so even if there is someone, you know, jamming the price down and keeping it at 30 or keeping it under 50 for the next year or something like that, because they, you know, just, just don't believe in it and they're shorting the heck out of it or whatever, I think the volumes will be higher and we'll be getting, it'll be a bull market for people, number of people getting right, in. Right. This is a bull market for minting new Bitcoiners and getting toward that that intransigent minority of 10 million Bitcoiners in the United States that we need to win the race to avoid the war. Obviously, I'm name checking yeah. my, my two big articles <laughs> on this. So look yeah. up 10 million Bitcoiners and look up the race to avoid the war, uh, both on the Swan blog. Um, but that is really what we need. Like this is if you have 10 million people in the United States who have a decent chunk of their net worth in Bitcoin and understand and care about it enough to, you know, make it a little bit difficult for a politician that takes an anti-Bitcoin stance by showing up at a yeah. town hall meeting or writing some letters or going on TV and talking about it and just presenting the truth, you mm -hmm. know, because you don't need to shade Bitcoin with clever positioning or marketing angles or anything. Like literally as people discover the truth about Bitcoin, Bitcoin recruits people to Bitcoin on its own just by being exactly what it is. Um, and so we don't need to flip government. We just need enough people in the United States to make it difficult to be anti-Bitcoin. Right, right. And the My reason it's about the United States is because this is the this is the power structure. This is the only entity. The U.S. government is the only entity globally that has enough power and enough money to make life difficult and create exactly. some kind of dark period for Bitcoin and Bitcoiners. Bitcoin will still yeah. win even if they attack Bitcoin. It just could be ugly for a couple of decades and that would suck. And I'd rather live, you know, most of my life that's remaining in a, in a bright orange in future with, with Bitcoin yeah. being smoothly adopted. Yeah. Speaking of that in the in the federal government, here's Robert uh, F. J., uh, Robert F. Kennedy uh, Jr. He comes in. And he's going to be, I think, running for president this time. Uh, he he's obviously hitting on Fed now and and the CBDC idea and this whole idea of programmable money, digital ID, social credit scores, basically, kind of the model that China has been very successful in implementing. And obviously, with the rollout of the digital yuan, with with yeah. Fed now happening in July which I think a lot of people were surprised at how quickly this, this came about. Um, where do you think this starts to, do you, do you truly think we're going to see a divisive uh, scenario start to play down the aisles of our lawmakers now where we're going to have a pro and, a, and against of what's happening in the Fed now and possibly a, a digital currency playing into this in a very short period of time? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. So um, Fed now is not a CBDC. I think that's extremely clear. Um, but it does provide a the great rails. opportunity to start talking about this. It's not even yes. necessarily the rails for it. I mean, you can use this just transferring between institutions. I do like that it's making people get out in front early. So even if, mm -hmm. even if the reason for saying Fed now is opening the door for CBDCs isn't right. logically correct. Uh, that's fine because we need to be having the conversation about CBDCs exactly. and nipping this thing in the bud as soon as possible. Um, what Fed now does actually do, which is system systemically dangerous, is uh, basically makes it much easier. In my understanding, it makes it much easier for there to be capital flight or you know basically bank runs because you have you have transfer windows open twenty four seven instead of just during banking hours. And so you know there could yeah. be 
a lot of deposits fleeing an institution basically over the weekend when most people aren't working or something like that. So I've, I've heard I've heard that narrative as maybe creating a, an, an accidental new risk in the system because of yeah. the, the creation of Fed now. But, you know, I'm not I'm not deep on it. I basically read up enough to to know that it's not a CBDC uh, and that it's just kind of sparking the CBDC conversation, which I welcome. Well, I think, yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up in, in terms of um, the ability of creating kind of these mini bank runs uh, out there, because that is, you're exactly right, the access to the system is going to be different than that of what we see in normal ACH transactions. And every, anybody and everybody who is moving money between bank accounts right now and your brokerage or bank accounts and exchange, wherever you're going to buy Bitcoin, um, there, you're all getting a chance to see this in action. Now we're going to see this in maybe real-time action, which is going to be intriguing because it will change behavior, I think, in the financial system. Last question to you is Fidelity. Fidelity moves out. Um, we, we tested it. We looked at the crypto side of it, which is mainly Bitcoin and ETH. They are. We bought some uh, Bitcoin there on Fidelity. Everything went fine. They've been making a lot of modifications to this. What do you think about Fidelity and does this pose any kind of challenge in the future, do you think, with what you guys are doing at Swan in terms of a strategy? Yeah, so I mean, awesome for Fidelity to jump in. Again, I'm, I'm, I built Swan because I was into Bitcoin. <laughs> I'm not into Bitcoin because I built Swan. So yeah. I'm, I'm in it for the orange coin and, and number go up and, and trying to spread freedom to all humans, right? Financial freedom and sovereignty. So. Uh, so I welcome it. I hope that they add uh, withdrawals. I think they uh, they're holding on to the coins for now, and uh, you know, so I, it would be great if at some yes. point they enable withdrawals. Yeah. And obviously, until that date, we have a great point of dif differentiation. Yeah. Um, you know, it, interesting how they position their fees because they bake in a one percent spread and claim that they have no fees, which is a very mm. common uh, it's game. It's common for these brokerages. <laughs> this is this yeah. Is normal. So yeah. Robin yeah, so I mean, Swan Swan has no spread and very transparent, you know, 0.99% fees. So uh, yeah. it's basically exactly the same, except you can actually own real Bitcoin instead of an IOU. So at least for now, uh, you know, we're still by far the better place to buy. Plus you get, you know, client service and experts to talk to about Bitcoin. And, you know, the other thing is you have to remember is, having a buy Bitcoin button doesn't do anything for you. There are a bunch of community banks and regional banks mm -hmm. that have added, you know, a buy Bitcoin button and nobody yep. buys through them. If it doesn't come with the education, the community, remember 95% of the time spent totally agree. by Swan talking to people is about Bitcoin. Maybe 5% mm -hmm. is about, you know, onboarding and your account, but almost all of it is actually about Bitcoin itself. And so these big financial institutions are not doing the lifting of talking to people about Bitcoin because they don't have any employees that know anything about Bitcoin for the most part. And certainly not the type of people that would actually be jumping on the phone or going back and forth in chat and actually answering your questions about Bitcoin. So Swan has by far the largest customer support team for Bitcoin in the world. It's, you know, over 100 people that live and breathe Bitcoin every day and can't even get a job with Swan unless they're already heavy into Bitcoin and can answer, yeah. you know, tell me exactly your three favorite episodes of Stefan Lavera's show, you know, or like <laughs> who's your favorite guest on Robert Breedlove's show? Like, and tell yeah. me about that. What was your favorite chapter of the Bitcoin standard? Like these are the, these are the interview questions that are, you're not getting a job with Swan. Um, so we're by far the best place to actually learn about Bitcoin alongside accumulating it into, you know, your personal account, your company account, your IRA, like whatever. So I don't see that going away, you know, in the next few decades. I yeah, think it's a, kind of soon. open, open well, field the, running for Bitcoin companies. Yeah. I, and I think the financial institutions, they've always had a challenge of being able to get to an education layer. Now we're talking about something that is, in, I think, a little bit more nuanced, you know, that would require what you're saying is a lot more expertise levels that maybe they're not willing to invest in. But, you know, from a yep. sense of potential adoption, at least kind of kicking the curb on buying a Bitcoin or yeah. getting into it, they could contribute pretty heavily uh, to at least I sure awareness. hope so. Yeah. 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 No, I, I mean, I, I hope that people buy a ton of Bitcoin wherever you can get it. <laughs> there you go. Like, hey, Corey, it's always we're all fun. on the same team. Yeah, it's always fun uh, chatting up with you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, stopping in today. We appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Paul. You bet. 
All right, so you guys are tuned in over on the podcast side of things. Make sure and jump over here to the YouTube channel. This is where we do all the cool stuff. And it's also where you get a chance to jump into the Diamond Circle. That is our private member group where we do a lot of additional analysis. We drop a lot of additional content. Even our own research is dropped into our Diamond Circle emails out to you guys. All you have to do is join. It's free. And of course, if you want to reach me, it's very simple. Hit me out there on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.